Okay. Okay, so Dale, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And I want to thank Ed and, uh, and Debbie for inviting me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Yesterday, when I was talking with Debbie and Dave, who I think will join us a little later, um, we were talking about the actual title and the topic that I would be talking about today. And I would like to have an idea of how many of you, I know one at least, um, how many of you have children who have hearing losses? And if you can let me know, now I lost access to the chat, so Debbie's gonna help me out with this. And how many of you have children who have a hearing loss? And uh, while you're letting us know that, we were thinking of really broadening the topic because uh, we were an intimate group and we really want to talk about the fact that kindness starts with us and kindness starts with us and that will really be our theme which is how can you nurture a meaningful relationship with kindness whatever that relationship is so we'll be really addressing different kinds of relationships and i'll be asking you questions to think about your own experiences i can't talk about kindness without thanking Debbie, particularly and publicly, because one of the wonderful qualities of kind people often is that they have patience. And we've had quite a journey with my slides and my <laughs> computer. So Debbie has demonstrated uh, gentleness and stick to and patience as we were putting this uh, slideshow together. So Debbie, do you have an idea how many of our audience members and participants have a child who has a hearing loss? Um, Tanya says she works with children and family as part of her uh -huh. career. And then um, Kayla says she works at the outreach agency and support family who uh, have children who are deaf or hard of hearing. Fine, and, and I remember um, Another Amber. person said she works yep. for early steps. Great, great. And then I, Kathy, Kathleen yep. said she had the two-year-old daughter with a hearing loss. Wonderful. I appreciate knowing the um, really the 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 membership here for tonight, and I encourage your questions and I encourage your comments and. Um, just so you know a little about me, I, I am a psychologist. My, my um, graduate work, my master's degree uh, was in education of the deaf. And in those days, that's what it was called. And so I come with the background as a teacher of children who have hearing losses. And I've worked with all ages of children in the classroom. And then I migrated to working with families. And so I've worked in different parts of the world. And I really enjoy my work with families of kids who have hearing losses. And my private practice has changed over the years. It's really expanded. I work a lot with adults who have hearing losses and families, and I work with businesses and communities and organizations. And since the book came out about kindness, what I've noticed is that we really need a lot more kindness in relation to people who are not, quote, like us, whatever that means. And how can we nurture meaningful relationships? So I'm going to, I just wanted you to have that, um, a little kind of view of, of my background. And then I went and I studied uh, early childhood and developmental studies and psychology. So I've been practicing for many, many years, um, over 45 and, and I love meeting families, I love meeting people, and I'm always learning. So sometimes I feel that my role is to be the person who shares with whomever I'm speaking to other people's experiences. Because I've been very fortunate in people in that people have shared their life experiences with me. And I hope that some of those experiences can be helpful to you tonight and that you will be sharing we'll be sharing together. 
So my first slide is, it really starts with us. Dr. Richie Davidson is a- um, not, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you, you need to click on share your screen. I'm sorry, what? Share, share your screen. I'm sorry, I didn't realize it wasn't shared. And now I thought I had done that, hold on. And you can always interrupt. The problem is finding the share screen again. That's what went away. Um, having a problem with the share screen, finding the share screen, it's not coming. You went to the top of the screen yesterday. Yes, and I'm there now. Hi, Dave. Um, there now, it says next, last viewed, see all slides, zoom in, hide presenter view, screen. It's not, wait a minute, taskbar. Uh, nope, trying again. Dave, if you have any suggestions, that would be great. Um, you're on the Zoom window, right? Yes, I am, but I can't seem to access the, um, the taskbar that we had just before we went on. Do you have anything on the bottom to participants? chat, share screen, record, live transcript and all that? Or is that on the top? That was on the top. It should be right in that area. Yeah, and it's not there. It's not there. This is what happened yesterday. And I apologize to all of you. Um, I want to know, Debbie, can you advance the screen? Can you advance the slides from where you are? I can bring up your PowerPoint um, that I had, the version that I have, if you wish. Let's let's go with that now because okay. I don't want to waste time and I want to be able to be as okay. present as possible. How's that? Okay. Good Thank fine. you. Thank you. Here we go. Okay, can Debbie. Everyone see the PowerPoint? Everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, no, give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, Debbie, I'm sorry to ask you to do this, but would you advance to the next? Can you be my advance man? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will be your advance. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So um, one of the things that I wanted to start with is that it really does start with us and the it is kindness. This is a quote from a very special person in my life. His name is Dr. Richie Davidson. And Eloise, he's from Wisconsin. I heard you mention before that you're from Wisconsin. And he runs the neuropsych department at the University of Wisconsin. And what he says is that we can each take responsibility to be kinder. I'm trying to, to also move my slide. Hold on. And that's not happening. All right, we're having a problem. To be kinder and to transform our minds in ways that will promote increased cooperation, kindness, and increased well being. So, what does that really mean? It means that we have to care for ourselves to be able to care for others, and that we have to take the responsibility to be kinder to ourselves and others, and then we will have changes in our minds and the changes will want us to do more kind acts. And I'll talk about that as we go further. Um, there's a problem here also just to mention. Okay, I can advance. Um, All right, you're advancing on your dream, but tell me when to advance on my end. I will. I just wanted to see if I could advance. Can you advance now? Um, there's your next dream. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like you all to think of someone who was kind to you in your life. I'd like you to think of a person. It can be someone from when you were young. It can be someone from when you were the age that your child is now. It can be someone who was a family member, perhaps a teacher or a mentor, bring that person into your mind. And if you can, think of what that kindness looked like or felt like. And now I'd like you, now that you have that feeling, think of a time when you were kind to someone. 
And what did that feel like? What did it really feel like inside of you? And now I'd like you to think about who have been your kindness role models? And who are your kindness role models right now at this time of your life? Are they people in your community? Are they people in your family? Are they colleagues? Are they people who you don't know, but are perhaps celebrities or leaders of some sort? Who are your role models for kindness? And just think about them. Think about their attributes. Think about the way they behave. And now I'd like you to think about how you can be a role model for kindness. Because a very important element as we raise children, both with hearing loss and without hearing loss, is how we are being their role models. So tonight I will be referring back to role models and one of the things that we all can do is try to develop compassionate habits. We can start to look through a lens of kindness. We look for kindness. We develop meaningful connections, both with our children, with the people in our families, with the people in our neighborhoods. Because kindness and meaningful relationships are rooted in several characteristics among them the connection, and also compassion. But also, what we also rely on with kindness is paying attention, listening with our whole body, with our heart, and knowing our own limits and boundaries so that we can be present <clears throat> and that we are kind to ourselves, and that we fill our own reservoir so that when we are there as a role model, when we are there giving kindness, we have enough to give. So part of tonight's talk will also be about nurturing kindness within ourselves as we develop meaningful relationships with our children and other people in our lives. Debbie, if you don't mind, could you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Ed mentioned that I, I actually co-authored my most recent book, which is called The Kindness Advantage. And it's based on making meaningful connections with others. The point of the book is to help children become compassionate and connected and to understand why kindness is so important. I wrote the book with my niece, Amanda Salzauer, and she's a social worker. We worked on this book for many years. When we started it, we really started it because we saw so much divisiveness that was happening and bullying and really unkind behavior. And the book has been out for uh, three years and it took us several years to write it. And what was really sad was that when the book came out, everybody said, oh, how did you write it so quickly? Because there's so much, there's so much unkindness now. And we were hoping that the book would be able to help people. And we still hope that the book will be able to help people recognize what are the components of kindness? What is the kindness advantage? The kindness advantage for ourselves and our children is to live a life with compassion and to recognize the importance of connection with other people <clears throat> and to value kindness. And kindness is the key to our children's current and future well-being. Kindness to themselves, kindness to those around them. And we can equip our children with the skills that they need to have a positive influence on the world. That the world does not just revolve around them, but that they are here 
to serve others, that we are all here to make this world a better place, and that we can help our children, whether they have a hearing loss or not, to form the habits of compassion that will last for their entire lifetime. But we have to do it ourselves. We have to be the kindness role models. So Deb, if you don't mind putting on the next slide. When we wrote the book, we wanted to define kindness and we came up with this definition. This is not all of kindness and I welcome your input. But when we think of people who are kind, when you think of the role models, when you think of the people who were kind to you, perhaps they showed you that they paid attention to you and that they were patient with you and that they communicated with you respectfully and that they showed compassion. And when people are kind, they show compassion to themselves and others. And why is this important? And why is it particularly important for children? Because it leads to compassion. It leads to happiness. There are many studies, particularly studies in the last six to seven years, that are showing correlation between happiness and kindness, empathy and kindness, confidence, particularly confidence in children, that they are developing a good self-worth and a good self-esteem, improving their self-esteem when they are kind to others, when they internalize kindness. They have improved relationships, peer relationships, as well as intergenerational relationships because they feel they have value. Kindness is also linked to improved physical and mental health emotional health. It's linked to a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning in life, whether it's children or adults. Kindness is also linked to reduced anxiety and reduced depression. And we have seen this really shown its face during COVID, where people who are able to do kind acts for others are feeling more in control of their lives and they are getting out of their own head, so to speak, and connecting with others, noticing what other people need and their anxiety and their depression is reducing. It is also linked, kindness is also linked to future success. So kindness calms our mood and it takes the focus off of ourselves. And I wanna be clear, we must be kind to ourselves. We cannot go to an empty well and try to give water. We have to be kind to ourselves, have self-compassion, which I will talk about. But it takes, it takes our mind off of ourselves only. And when you smile at someone, it generally gives you a smile back. Kindness leads to so many good things that improve relationships. As I said, and I will repeat, improved self-esteem, improved happiness, improved physical and mental health. And there are many studies which we can cite where you will know this to be true. Deb, the next slide, please. <clears throat> When we wrote our book, we talked about the 10 fundamentals of kindness. We narrowed it down to 10. We started off with over 30, and this is what we came down to. What we came down to were the 10 fundamentals. And I would ask you to think about what these mean to you in your life. Acceptance, acceptance who we are as we are, accepting your child, as they are, a commitment to something or someone. And these 10 fundamentals of kindness, and I'll go through them, were present in all of the people that we interviewed for the book. 
And we wanted to know what are these basic tenets, these basic characteristics that kind people have. And what we did was we explored each of them. So in addition, in addition to acceptance and commitment, there was connection, connection with the other person or connection with a cause, connection with the environment. Whatever it was, there was a connection, a real connection, not superficial, a connection from the head and the heart. There was empathy. The ability to try to understand and put ourselves into someone else's experience. What is it like for them? What is it like emotionally, physically? What is their experience of what they're going through? How can I try to understand and feel what they are feeling? Empathy. There was always giving, giving of themselves, giving in many, many ways. Kind people liked to give. Kind people are interested, interested in learning, interested in the other person, interested in their experience, interested in what makes them who they are. They don't want to change them. They're inquisitive. They're curious. And that's interest. Kind people tend to be nurturing, nurturing of themselves and what they need, but nurturing of another human being, nurturing of taking care in a way that is meaningful to the person, not necessarily what they would want, but understanding what the other person would want. They observe. People seem to watch, they listen, they pay attention, they observe, they get the lay of the land before they come barging in. Kind people are good observers and they question, they ask questions. As I said before, they're inquisitive and they value these qualities in other people. So if you're a parent who has a child who's asking so many questions, Sometimes it can be overwhelming, but understand that that's just showing they're inquisitive and they want to know why, and they might push hard. And the 10th fundamental of kindness is that people are themselves. They're authentic. They're exactly who they are. So if we want to raise children to be kind, we nurture a relationship with them with these things in mind. We want them to be themselves. We encourage them to be who they are. We don't want them to become something other than who they are. And we have to make space for our kids to be who they are because they may not be exactly who we thought they would be. They may not be exactly what we wanted them to be, but who they are is their essence. And it's our job to help them be the best that they can be as they are. So I'd like you to think of who in your life has been accepting of you, who was committed to you, with whom you feel a connection, who's interested in you, and how that makes you feel. So let's go to the next slide, because the next slide talks a little bit about what happens in our brain when we help others, when we are kind. When we show kindness, our brain literally changes. It changes. And what happens to us is we get a feeling called the helper's high. This phrase was labeled by a man named Alan Lux, who did research in watching people and studying people who went out of their way to be kind to other people. And he said, I wonder what's going on with these people. He mostly studied volunteers. And volunteers are usually among the happiest people 
gratified and satisfied with their life, looking forward to being able to be of service. And he was found this very interesting. So what happens in a simplistic way is that we get a flood of endorphins and the endorphins are the feel good hormones that are also like natural painkillers. What happens is it's in response to pain or stress, this group of hormones are released and we get a general feeling of well being. That's when we do a kind act. So we feel so good that we are much more likely to want to do another kind act. And the person that we were kind to, the recipient of the kind act, they also experience a flood of endorphins and they want to do something kind for someone else. And that's when people talk about kindness being contagious because we do one kind act we feel good about it we want to do more the person who receives the kind act feels good so they might want to pay it forward have it be kindness contagion they will do something for someone else and then and this always blows me away when you observe someone doing a kind act when you read about it or when you hear about it, you also get a flood of endorphins and that is called moral elation. You want to be able to help someone else. When you watch the news at the end of the day, generally there's at the end of the news, which is really hard to take these days, generally at the end of the newscast, there might be a feel good story or a story about somebody's doing something in their community. And generally, after we watch that and we learn about what that person's doing in their community and how they're helping someone, we feel good and often we'll say, well, oh, maybe I can do something in my community. Kindness is a natural stress buster. When Debbie introduced me this evening, she talked about today is National Stress Reduction Day. Doing a kind act will absolutely help with stress busting. And I will go so far as to say that kindness is a lifesaver. So really what happens is there is a change in our brain. And the more we look through that lens of kindness, the more we look for opportunities to do kind acts, to say kind things, to think kind thoughts about ourselves and others. We will have this experience. I just, before I go to the next slide, when I said kind thoughts about ourselves, I said that specifically. Many of us, have a very critical voice in our head. And it is an unkind voice. And one of the things that is very important to do if you start to think about compassion and self-compassion is to take control of that voice, understand where it comes from and see if it's helpful. Is it encouraging? Is it the voice you would want to give to a child who's having a hard time? We'll talk about that a little bit more, but I want you to know that we can also control the relationship that we have with ourselves in regard to kindness and having access to what I call the happy hormones. So Debbie, if you don't mind going to the next slide. In this next slide, I specifically speak to parents and I'd like you to pay attention and particularly for those parents who have children who have hearing losses, or for those of you who identified yourselves as working with families and kids who have hearing losses. Very often, parents are seen as very compassionate and empathic and resilient. They may not feel that way, but that's how they're seen. And very often, parents are putting their own needs last. Generally, people who are in helping professions put their own needs last. So there's a lot to learn from this. And one of the things that I would ask you to do 
as parents, and everyone really, but particularly parents, is to stay in the present moment as much as you can, to breathe deeply, and to check in with your body to see where you're holding your tension. And to take a moment and to do that so that throughout the day, you are breathing and taking, taking stock of how you're doing. That it isn't just a knee-jerk reaction, particularly when your children want your attention, but that you ground yourself so that you can respond with kindness to yourself and to your children. It's important to pause and to breathe and to stretch and to allow yourself to be okay in this moment, whatever you're feeling, and just recognize it. Because when we recognize what's going on in a moment, we then can say, wow, I'm really having a hard time. Or this is really disappointing. Or boy, I wish this wasn't happening. And then you recognize it and you can say, okay, what do I need to do to take care of myself in this moment so that I can do what I think would be helpful in this situation. We all lose it from time to time. One of the things about nurturing a kind relationship with our children is to be able to take responsibility and ownership for when we do lose it and say, oh, I'm so sorry that I did that. I'm so sorry I said that. If I could roll it back, I wish I would have said this. The kind thing to do for children is not try to never lose it. Well, that's kind. But when we do, to own it and then to say, I'm really sorry, I really lost it. And that is a kind thing to do because so many children think their parents never say they're sorry, never take responsibility for, they take responsibility within themselves, but to just say, boy, how might I have handled that differently? And that's also being a role model for your children to say, what's another way I could have done it? I often counsel parents to tell yourself something that you appreciate about yourself and something that you are grateful for in your life and to do that throughout the day. I'm grateful there was no traffic when I brought my kid to school. I'm grateful that my teacher, the teacher who works with my student, with my class, with my kid, whomever, that they really care about my kid. I'm grateful that my kid is happy today, whatever it is, but to pay attention and to bring it front and center. And again, take calming breaths throughout the day to help you not stay too close to the edge. When we are compassionate to ourselves and when we really pay attention to kindness for ourselves, we, we feel a little more peace internally. And at any stage of our life, we can develop these skills. So Deb, could you put the next slide, please? I'd like you to look at your child through a lens of kindness. And I'd like you to, at this moment, think back to this week and recall one kind act that you saw your child engaged in. And if you don't have a child, I'd like you to think of someone in your world, someone in your orbit, who did a kind act. And now I'd like you to think, why was this kind act important to you? What was it about that kind act? that connected with you, that you felt good about. And just think about that. Deb, if you could put the next slide, I'd appreciate it. This slide is about kindness and nonverbal communication. We are sometimes unaware of all of the nonverbal messages that we send. And sometimes those nonverbal messages undermine our words. And by those nonverbal messages, I'm talking about the way we stand, I'm talking about our facial expression, I'm talking about what we're, what we're doing with our body. What are we communicating with our body? 
And I'd like you to think of what nonverbal communications communicate safety, respect, care, love, appreciation, trust, all of these, I'd like you to think about what does that look like? What does it sound like? Your tone of voice, how fast you speak, your eye contact, your body language. Think of that. Respect, safety, love, care, trust, appreciation. Visualize yourself communicating with your child, communicating with your partner, communicating with your friends. What does it look like? Our nonverbal communication is so important when it comes to communicating kindness. And all of those words that I read to you. This is a question I'd like you to think about. In what ways do you create time and space where your children or the children in your life or in your classroom feel secure and feel valued? In other words, what do we do to create an environment where our kids feel that way? Do we soften our tone? so that our children pick up that we care about them rather than they're just one more thing in our way. We're so busy, we're preoccupied, we're frustrated, we're agitated. Because most children interpret when they see their parents and their teachers having those experiences of agitation and frustration, they kind of think it's because of them. It may be. But more often than not, it's not. So we want to be able to give our children a feeling that we value them, we respect them, we pay attention to them, they're important to us through our nonverbal and our verbal communication. So I'd ask you now, we're gonna to go to the next slide, to think about what does kindness look like to a child? And perhaps you can put some of your responses into the chat if you'd like to, or if you have a piece of paper, you can jot them down. What does kindness look like to a child? And it might be easier if you bring to mind a child you know. And then I'd like you to do this at home as well. The next slide is the same slide, but what does kindness look like to a child who has a hearing loss? So you can enter that into the chat and maybe Deb, if you care to, you can read a couple of the responses. A couple responses is yes, a hug, a smile, uh, go down to talk to him at his level. Remember their birthdays. Um, one person is kind of to a child saying yes to something they want to do and giving the encourage, encouragement and protection. Hug or comfort. Hug when he or she cries. A hug. Lots of hugging. That's that nonverbal. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those. And I'd like you to think about those when you, when you go back home and you're with your children or you're with your children in their class or you're with your nieces or nephews or your grandchildren, look at that child and say, what does that child think kindness looks like? Because we are all unique. Let's go to the next slide for a moment, if you will. There's a couple more responses. Oh, sure, uh, sure. Child, paying attention, handling interruptions by a child in a kindly way, affection, showing interest in what they're doing, security and affirmation, affirmation, 
and making them feel included. Perfect. Thank you for, for contributing those. Sometimes hearing them from other people and seeing what other people have, have as their interpretation of what kindness looks like helps us when we're with a whole bunch of kids. I think that in addition, we can also notice something positive about them and tell them, you know, you really are so incredibly gentle with the dog. That's why the dog likes to be with you because you don't scare the dog. You just come up and you're so sweet. Or, you know, it was so nice that you remembered to ask grandma how she was feeling because last week she was sick. To be very specific about the kindness and the attributes that your children have to articulate it for them, to show that you value it. And give your child the kind of open-hearted listening that you want to receive. So when your child is wanting to talk to you, as one of you said, be on their level or bring them up to your level on the chair, put your phone down, try and really pay attention to them. If you're doing something else, say, oh, sweetie, I wanna hear what you have to say. I have to finish this. Give me three minutes and then come back in three minutes so that they know that they are heard and that you will value what they say. Give yourself and your child credit. You know, boy, we really worked hard on this math. We've, you've come such a long way. You know, we've come a long way. I've learned so much about whatever. Let your child see that it's really okay to say that was hard and I feel good about my accomplishment. And think of a shared experience you had with your child and talk about it. So, you know, I was thinking about when we went last summer, when we went and we were hiking together, I felt so good to be able to share that with you. That they're important in your life and remember details. Remember when it rained, when we were out in the open and we had to run? There's a continuity, there's a connection. Utilize all your senses. That when you drink tea, say, oh, smell it, it's so wonderful. Oh my gosh, it tastes so bitter or whatever. Engage with all your senses when you're with your children. Bake something together, feel things. No matter what age, utilize your senses because it helps you to be more present. The next slide is so important to be able to build a relationship of meaning. Whether you volunteer together formally or informally, do something that reflects your interests and your child's interests. You can do it as a family, with other people in the community, but be sure that it reflects your child's interests and your interests. The next slide I'd like to see, I'd like you to just because you are, <coughs> parents and teachers and, and volunteers, always try to understand what are the most stressful moments and aspects of my life? Where am I feeling stress right now? Once we really look at that, we can ask ourselves, what do I do to lift my spirits? What do I do to get a break? And is what I'm doing healthy for me? If it's not healthy for me, how can I make a change? The next slide. Stress can bring out the worst of us and it can bring the best of us out. Well-managed stress can make us more caring. We care for others and it changes our brain because we can, we can actually, in our deep caring, if our stress is managed, we can actually develop, develop courage, we can develop hope, we can become more resilient. And kindness towards ourselves and others is an essential part of resilience. During COVID, so many of us were tested and we had to develop resilience. I'll talk about that in a little while, but we must pay attention 
to the kinds of stresses we have, how we're dealing with our stress, and whether we're dealing with them in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. And then we can monitor how our children are, help, are dealing with their stress. Healthy way, unhealthy way. Let's go to the next slide. I talked before about breath, and I just want you to each know the importance and the value of taking a breath before you do a new activity. It calms you, it calms your body, and it calms your mind. You can pick an object and you can just focus on that object. You can look at your hand and just breathe in and exhale. Just focus on the breath, feel the breath coming out of your nostrils. Put your hand on your belly, feel it rise and fall. The breath is one of your best friends when you're trying to think about being kind and develop a meaningful relationship. I'm just gonna go through this slide focusing on a few key points. I spoke about taking care of yourselves and connecting with others. I want to just speak a little bit about how important humor and laughter are because it also releases endorphins. Anticipate and accept change. Learn from your experience and don't get too married to, oh, I do it this way all the time, I have to do it that way, no. Be flexible. Learn new things about yourself. We all had to do that during COVID. And think about yourself as a constant learner so that when we make mistakes, you say, but I'm learning. It'll come, more practice. Be kinder to yourself so that you can be optimistic, whether it's about your child, about yourself as a parent, whether it's yourself with all the many hats you wear. Keep perspective and know that you're not alone in trying to be resilient. Integrate every experience that you have had, the good, the bad, the difficult, the easy, integrate it. It becomes part of who we are and it can transform us. If we face it, if we allow ourselves to have a hard time and let that be okay and learn skills to go forward. Resilience is really important. But in order to be resilient and to thrive, not just survive, we need to be kind to ourselves. The next slide, please. When we are kind to ourselves, we think of five elements. Just to tell you the truth, these five elements were the elements in my previous book, which was called Sanity Savers. And I will invite you to um, Explore that book if you like, but we are essentially thinking about ourselves, our body, mind, and our spirit. Support, the kind of support we have and the support that we give to others. Our surroundings, how can we create peaceful surroundings? What do we do to stimulate ourselves? To give ourselves purpose, meaning, and curiosity? And how can we savor and appreciate and be grateful for this moment. And this is very important. I talked before that resilience is a skill that can be learned because of the transformational aspect of it. I talked about mind, body, and spirit. This is just a slide. I'm sorry, could you advance the slide, Deb? Could you advance the slide? to the self-care slide. Uh, thank you. Can you advance to the next slide on self-care? Thank you, next. I'm sorry that I didn't ask you to advance. There we go. Let's stay there for a moment. Sometimes, when we are so busy with our lives, we forget about taking care of ourselves. And what's important is to be able to remember that we are a whole functioning human being and we have needs. We do better when we eat healthfully, when we move our bodies, and when we are out in nature. Deb, could you move to the next slide, please? 
lately I've been doing a lot of work with sleep and how important it is for us to sleep. However much sleep you need, please try and get as much uninterrupted sleep as you can. And find out what your child needs, how much sleep your child needs. I try to help people do relaxation before sleep so that even if you're not sleeping, you can relax before sleep, which means putting your devices away, which means trying to breathe and get in touch with your body, perhaps having a chamomile tea before you go to bed, whatever it takes for you to be relaxed before you go to bed, it's really important to try and get deep, uninterrupted sleep. Next slide, please. We're almost at the end. I mentioned before with laughter, just pick one of these and, and get into it because laughter stimulates the release of the endorphins that I mentioned before. And that allows you to have less pain. It oxygenates all of your organs, all of your cells. It increases your energy and a whole sense of well-being. It actually strengthens your immune system. There are wonderful studies about the effects of laughter every day. Do you know in India, there are laugh clubs and there are some laugh clubs here where you just try to laugh at various times during the day. And laughter and the endorphins which are released, which is basically serotonin, protects us from the damaging aspects of stress most particularly depression. So what's important is to watch funny movies and to laugh as much as you can and to be with people who like to laugh and to have fun. Let's look at the next slide. Nurturing positive relationships. You all mentioned hugs. Look in these pictures how many people are hugging. It was so difficult during COVID and it still is for many of us. But the people who are in your pod, give them hugs, touch them, let them know that you are skin to skin and nurture those positive relationships. Let's go to the next slide. And supportive relationships come in many, many forms. This dog is the dog who's on the couch. Whatever the relationships are that make you feel good. The next slide is please, please nurture your spirit, whatever that means for you. Whether it's practicing your religion, whether it's having a spiritual experience, whether whatever it is, it is so important for our grounding and for us to have a spiritual aspect in our life that we can rely on. Let's go to the next slide. For many of us, a daily meditation practice can be very helpful. It usually has to do with breath and being able to focus on our breath to support our physical and mental health. The next slide is a loving kindness meditation, which I find extremely helpful. And you can send positive thoughts and energy to yourself and to others. It's very simple. And basically what we think about as we nurture positive relationships and kindness is may I be safe, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be at ease, may you be well, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be at ease, and you consider the people in your life, may your partner, may your child, may your teachers, May your colleagues, you go out in concentric circles until you are sending to the world and then come back to yourself. When people are in relationships that are difficult, they say, oh, I can't talk to them. I can't stand them. They were, we're always fighting. Sit back, take breath, and wish them well. If you want to know more about loving kindness meditation, I encourage you to look up Sharon Salzberg or Tara Brock. As we move through, I mentioned before about creating peaceful surroundings. One of the things is to reduce our clutter. And Debbie, if you can go to the next slide and then the one after that, as a wrap up, 
in self-care. Notice flavors, notice colors, notice textures, notice kind acts. Notice the precious moments that you have in your life. And the next slide. Mindfully live your life with self-compassion while you care for your child. Do the things you love, even if you only do them for five minutes. Give yourself gifts every day so that you can show up in the way you want to with kindness. And the, Deb, the next slide is just a thank you if you want to be in touch with me. And here are some of the books that you may wish to use. And I thank you for your time. And I would love to entertain questions and comments. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I loved it. Loved thank it. you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody has any questions? Uh, feel free to use the raise hand physically, or you can use the raise hand button in the reaction. Anybody has any question? One thing that I was um, one thing I was taught was. If you put your foot in yesterday and your foot in tomorrow, because you worry about what's happening tomorrow and you're all upset about what's happening, what happened yesterday, you end up sitting on today. So if you keep your foot <laughs> in, into today, you only have nothing but today to deal with. And that means the world of me. So I try not to. Tomorrow hasn't come. I only got today to work with. So um, I like that kind of place. Thank you for sharing that, Debbie. It's, it's so true because sometimes we live in yesterday and we, we are concerned about what we did and we think, oh, I shouldn't have done that and I should have done it this way. And or we worry about what's coming up and oh my goodness, what's going to happen? And we make a catastrophe about something that hasn't happened, which doesn't mean that we don't remember or think about, but we do it from the perspective of now. So that what did I learn from yesterday? How can I change if I need to, or what do I want to do that? How can I do that again? So we bring it, you know, again, it's the weave. How is it all part of us? And if we said something that we were sorry for, we can say, I'm really sorry I did that. And I hope the next time I'll have the presence of mind to do it differently. And then the next time, when you're in that next time, you can say, ah, I think I'll do this differently this time. And of course we all plan for the future, but we can't live in the future. We only are living now. You know, a friend of mine wrote a book and the title is God Plan Man Plans, God Laughs. And it's true. We make all these plans and then something happens. So how do we pivot? How do we adapt? How do we make it part of our life? Even if we don't want it, what do we do to integrate everything so that we can take care of ourselves and have the most meaningful, purposeful lives with people who are in our lives? Um, Dave Bitter has a question. Go ahead, Dave. Yes. So, Dale, did, Hi, you, Dave. did you learn anything yesterday or is God laughing at you now? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Dave <laughs> helped me and helped me and Deb helped me with trying to deal with the, with the slides. So because they weren't cooperating, I could say, I didn't learn anything. But what I learned was the show must go on. Deb was an amazing partner. She came right up and we tried to do the best we could with what we had. I, I really did not want to get all worried and upset because I'm only with you now at this moment in time. We will never be again. We will never be together again as we are now. So I could either get really, really, really upset about the fact that I couldn't control my slides, or I could be so grateful that Debbie was there to be able to help me, and I could try and focus on what I was here to do. 
So what did I learn yesterday? I learned that number one, technology is not typically my bag, but I also learned that, as Debbie said, we are here now and we make the best of this moment. And I hope I was able to do that. I'm sorry that it got all screwed up, but we got through, we got through it pretty well. <laughs> okay, uh, now I can go to my serious question. Okay. Okay. Um, this is really great, but Thank you. for some reason, what's going on today still hitting me in the back of the head. How do we deal with showing kindness to either a toxic child or a toxic neighbor or whatever? I mean, somebody just toxic. It's a wonderful question, and it is truly the question of our times because there is such divisiveness. And for some of us, this toxicity is in our families. You know, Thanksgiving is coming up and you don't know who's necessarily going to be behaving in a way that you don't like. I think the way we do it is to try very hard to feed ourselves with what we need so we feel we have strength, we have, we know what our values are, we know who we are, we know that we live by, try to treat people the way you would like to be treated, the golden rule, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, and that we can only be responsible for our behavior. We can only be responsible for being a light in the world, for being a role model. I don't believe that we have to add to the toxicity. I think that we can find ways to say, I would like to have a conversation with you. What you're doing, what you're saying is very hurtful to me, is hurtful to my friend. I don't see the point. Can we discuss this in a different way? If not, I'm sorry but I need to protect myself and my family. But I think what's important is that we don't get way down into the dirt and start throwing all the dirt back and forth. If that's not who we are, we cannot let that become who we are. It's easy to be kind to somebody who's nice. It is not easy to be kind to someone who you feel is not kind. And that's one of the reasons I think that the loving kindness meditation is such an important tool to have in our toolbox. One of the things that I often say to people is try to imagine that they might be having a really hard day. If someone barks at you, maybe they're really having a hard day and maybe what they need is an extra dose of kindness. Maybe it's looks like you're having a hard time or wow, I don't, I don't think I deserve that. Can you say that a different way? I do that all the time. And it's like, oh my God, what did she say? But as far as the toxicity and somebody is totally on the other side of what you think is the right way, you know, the old phrase, we agree to disagree, doesn't really hold it very much right now because the way people disagree is not humane. So I think we say what we can, we act the way we can, and we wish a person well, and we say, I'd like to understand how you came to this point of view, but I can't hear you, I can't pay attention to you, if you are yelling at me or degrading me or using this kind of language, I would like to show up and find out how you got here, but not if you are disrespectful to me. And that sometimes works. Okay, we cannot we lose. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, we have, uh, you have more to add? Okay. All right, we have quite a few people in the chat box. I'm gonna start in the very beginning of the first person who asked the question. Um, 
couple people said you did a fantastic job. Um, Thank you. Um, and it, um, Dale, if you could put your contact information in the chat box, that would be great. Um, right, Debbie, can you move to the slide? Oh, no, you can't. Maybe you can send that slide because it has all my contact information and yeah, I can't I, get to I'll the chat. Happy to. Thanks. Um, do you have any suggestions or strategy for trying a fresh start or show kindness to someone after a conflict or an incident in which, which that person is unkind? Oh, sure. That's what I call life. <laughs> we are always in relationships that have conflict and we say, oh, I'll never talk to that person or how could I talk to them? I'm a great fan of letter writing. I will tell you that. Not emails and text, letter writing. And I like it because the hand is part of the process. <laughs> um, and sometimes I like to think about things. I write them. Sometimes I write letters. I don't even send them. I just like to write them down and get my thoughts out. Um, sometimes it's helpful to say to someone, I'm troubled by where we are. I'm troubled by our last interaction. I'm really unhappy that we lost our way, that we're off track, that we're not in touch. I'd like to try and reconnect in a way where we feel safe. Because very often in my experience, when people are very far away from each other, there's usually been a lot of words that have gotten behaviors that have been insulting or unkind. And it's hard to forgive. And it's hard to forget. And it's hard to move forward. So I think that if we say something like, you know, a lot of things were said, um, and a lot of things we've thought about. And I wonder if you would be interested in trying to move forward. Now, moving forward for somebody may say, yeah, let's, it's all behind us, we don't have to talk about it. Well, I kind of, I still would like to try and share with you what my feelings were and what my experience was. Would you be willing to have that conversation? You can only offer, but I think when we offer, we have to take responsibility. Not, you know, you were really horrible. You were this, you were that. I, I don't feel good about where we are. I'd like to try and help repair our relationship. And you can do that in the letter. You can do it face to face, but if you're not talking to each other, I generally don't like to use another person as an intermediary. Like tell your sister if she wants to, if she wants to get in touch with me, she knows where I am. No, that's generally not very effective. Take the responsibility to reach out. And some people may not be ready. Don't get too attached to whether or not they say yes or no. Just offer. But do express how you feel. Okay, uh, Mary asked, I was once told, think about whether the things that bothered you will matter in a year. If not, don't let it get to you. I always think that's great advice and I thank you for bringing that up. I think that I would amend it to say, why do you think that bothers you? What is it about that that bothers you? And is it worth that much attention or can you better use that attention elsewhere is this healthy for me is this helpful for me is what i'm thinking going to be problem solving or is it am i just ruminating over and over and over again and playing it over and over that's not helpful how can what happened be helpful? How can it be instructive? What can I learn from it? You know what? I don't think it's worth it. I'm going to leave it behind. And then when it pops up again, which it will, you can say, 
I wonder why that's coming up now. Something here must be familiar. Something's making me frightened. Something's making me concerned. Oh, that's what it is. Use it to learn about yourself and then move on. Don't let it keep you locked in where you are. I can ask you model how to handle the technical difficulty with a app bomb, app bomb. A P L A P L O M B. With a plum. Oh, how to? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Eloise said uh, did, you did a marvelous job, and I learned a lot. Can you can you verify what you what you said? Eloise, you want to elaborate on that? No. You're can muted. I You're muted. You're muted. I said I can verify everything oh. that you said because I live the <laughs> kindness. I had many who helped me, so I'm helping them to get where I'm at. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm I, I I really appreciate that, Eloise. I think that one of the things that we need, we need to be role models for others. And right. we need to go back and think about who was kind to us and what was that kindness? What did it mean to us and how has it shaped us and how can we be kind in their image? I mean, I will share with you something very personal. My father who has been dead for 26 years was without a doubt the kindest person I have ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And everyone who knew him would have said that. And he's always on my shoulder. And I always feel his presence and he's always encouraging me. And I feel that he got through so many challenging, difficult times and he did it with such strength and he faced it and he, and he was always kind. People loved him. He was like a magnet. And I, and I say to myself, you know, if dad could do it, when I have something hard, I can do it. He taught me how to do it, whatever it is. And I think that when we have people before us, our ancestors, friends, whether they're dead or alive, we can, we can feel their presence and their influence on us. And it can be very helpful so that when we feel alone or we feel like we just can't do it or we don't have an inch of kindness in us anymore, so what would they encourage us to do? They would say, count to 10, take a breath, take a walk, give it a moment. We don't have to figure this out alone. Um, we have Ed, people to help us. Yes. Uh, Ed said, a question for Dale. Uh, Regina Brett, a long-term popular writer for the Plan Dealer newspaper in Cleveland, author of author her most request column at the age of 90 when she wrote about the 45 lessons life taught me. Number 19 was, I never too late to, to have a happy childhood elf. It's so true. Thank you, Ed. You know, many of us had very traumatic childhoods. Many of us suffered and got through God knows what. And it's part of us, but we don't have to live there anymore. And we can have the childhood. We can, that's why the laughter is so important. We can have the silliness. We can connect with people who we like. We can meet and have new experiences, which will keep us young and keep our brain young. And this is this, we can do this and we can show our children how important it is to be out there in the world. And when they don't understand, say, give them the language to say, I didn't understand. Can you help me understand that? When we read to them, when we watch movies, say, what would you do in that situation? Why do you think that little girl answered in that way? Give them the opportunity to develop empathy and to understand why people do and say what they do. Talk about it. Show them alternative ways of behaving that suit them. So on that note, perhaps we can 
say that I wish you all a lens of kindness to look through the world. And I really thank you for having me join you. And perhaps another time we can meet again and we can talk about something else. <laughs> yes, and uh, we do have lots of other questions. Uh, there's about another seven more questions. Um, I will forward them to you, and that way um, you can email them personally if you like. Uh, and of course. And your suggestions to them. And again, thank, thank you. you so much um, for coming, and I appreciate you. your time. And thank you, everybody. I want to thank everybody to have a happy Thanksgiving. And if you're going to be alone, feel free to reach out to someone so you're not alone for Thanksgiving. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. To Bye, Dale. Bye. Bye. Bye, David. <laughs>